is, and we're starting it right with our first guest, Journey Around the Bedroom, they have written, and that is Diane Nora, who wrote this, and Jacqueline Biscop, who directed this charming children's interactive show. I just, it's my kind of show. So how did you find, I mean, it's about this real explorer, but you use him to help this little girl explore her bedroom. And it's perfect in these quarantine times because it makes your room more interesting. Instead of feeling like you're in a prison, you, you feel like, oh, I have things to explore. And it, it's not as terrible as I thought it could be. Um, the play is based on a real explorer, uh, Zavi de Maist, who had quite a life, who did a, a multitude of things. and while he was on house arrest for 42 days after dueling, he decided to sort of as a joke, write a travelogue about his experiences traveling around his bedroom and his brother took it from him and had it published and it became very famous and people really loved it. And so that was sort of the, the genesis for the idea for this play. I just thought, it seemed very familiar to our own current situation in which we have spent more time than any of us had ever imagined or wanted to in our own homes. And I also, um, having spent some time living with my nine-year-old niece during uh, the early days of quarantine, so I could keep an eye on her. Both of her parents are doctors and they had to go to work and she had to be homeschooled. Um, you know, I was always, so impressed by how imaginative she was and how she could still have fun in and around her, her tiny apartment. And so, yeah, so that's how it all started. How did you encounter that work? Because, um, I mean, I thought it was very obscure, but then when I was looking in Wikipedia, it's like all these modern writers reference it, you know, Borges and D.H. Lawrence and, and he also wrote a sequel, I think, um, like 30 years later or something. Yeah. So um, how did you discover him? <laughs> Thanks for bringing him to us. Yeah, I um, was reading a book of essays by the author Alain de Baton called The Art of Travel. And one of the essays talks about Xavier de Maist. It actually compares Xavier de Maist to another um, explorer and the point of sort of that essay is that travel is a state of mind more than a place that you go. And I read that, um, I actually picked up that book Ooh. when I was backpacking in Europe in my 20s. And then I made a piece about that essay 10 years ago that was for adults. And just sort of when I was thinking about what would be an interesting show to make for kids, Ooh. it just seemed like the parallels were there and it's such great source material. And Diane, you can unmute yourself now because I want to find out how you were able to take this 17th century story and, and, and update it for today and for an incredible interactive puppet show, which I want to talk how you managed to do. They were all in different areas of the world and it looked like, and only one person was moving things and it looked like, like they had like a cast of a million people and manipulating everything. I mean, it was really astounding, the accomplishment of this. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're so grateful to have you there. Um, you know, I think that we knew we wanted something to be interactive and lively uh, because part of what we all miss about theater is the coming together and the magic of what will go wrong any moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I recognize your voice from the play. It's very distinctive. I have a lovely speaking voice. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, Jacqueline and I um, both, uh, I think, really wanted to have something that would have moments where uh, we could really explore the different ways the puppets can move. Um, we worked with an incredible designer, uh, Myra G. Rivas, um, who did the puppets and really taught our actors how to manipulate them though um you know they have some experience puppeteering as well and everyone was very collaborative and game uh and just i think there was just a real uh we all miss what we do so <laughs> everyone was like how can we make it work you know a, a real spirit of uh let's do it 
<laughs> so, so I think that's sort of what, uh, where a lot of those moments came from, like, well, what if we tried this? And sometimes it would be a little silly, uh, or a little ridiculous, but, uh, we found a way to make it work. So, so it was a lot of fun. Well, the idea you... about confined space opening up to a kind of infinity and even with like the flat kind of painting, the ordinary painting that's on her wall, that that could become another infinite space. And, you know, like, I guess there's no real ceiling, at least in her imagination, because- God, know, like, it's kind of like the sky. slipping into the wallpaper, don't you think? I mean, there's yeah. a wonderful, wonderful old story called Sailings at Sitzer, where the boy goes to sleep and, and slides into his mother's yeah. wallpaper. And uh, this is a similar a similar story, Char quite charming, uh, I, particularly because of all the little flat characters. Uh, I thought I, I really, I really like that myself. So cute. And when you opened up the book with uh, you know the beautiful, uh, you had a picture of this uh, book, which I, I take it this is based upon a book, right? Correct. And uh, you, it's a lovely book, and you laid it down there and opened it up, and this wonderful little little bunch of buildings come rosing up out of the book, and this beautiful little, uh, beautiful little uh, balloon. And I thought the balloon was really, really charming. Uh, the skyline of Manhattan, right? You know, the skyline of Manhattan was there too. 17th uh, century plus skyline of Manhattan. It, it might have been. It just was so nice coming up out of the book. I thought, and I love yeah. it. I love that kind of thing. And also the way a hand could go from one to the other. And, and, and then, I mean, obviously my hand disappears, but the another hand came on the other frame. It was incredible. Yeah, it looks so smooth, but it must have been pandemonium <laughs> when you were working it out. <laughs> was that all a dream? <coughs> the girl's dream, little girl's dream? Huh, um, in a literal sense, I think it's it's something she's imagining. I don't yeah. think she slept through the whole night, but I love that interpretation too. I mean, um, because when she goes back and sleeps, you know, you realize perhaps it was a dream. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. It, Connecting it, the that. imagination is also a dream. You know, you your imagination is a dream while you are awake. And the fun part of, I, I, I actually did the interactive part. I chose to do that because I, I like joining in. And you get to learn to sing and, and you get to pick out how to save, help one of the characters. And there's all, it, it, it's, it's got adventure and obstacles, all the perfect elements of a kid's story that adults enjoy. Our children will just love it. I have a, my, my niece, two kid, little kids, they live in London. And they would just, I was thinking about them when I was watching this. And her, his name is Amil, and the daughter's name is Anaya. They will just adore this. How can we get this to them? Well, well um, the show does stream. You can watch it live. I'm not sure how that timing works out with mm. London. Yeah. Uh, starting after the live version is over on the 11th, there's an on-demand version, which is, of course, a recorded version of this. And um, yeah, they, the interactive moments will still be in, but there won't be other people's, you know, uh, seeing other right. people because it's yeah. recording. Yeah, it's beautiful, very cute, very cute, charming. And now we have from Indie Influencers, he's coming to be actually be a guest, Jay Michaels. And I didn't get a chance to talk to you, I mean, because I didn't know what you were going to do last show. And I was so touched. You actually brought me to tears. You said some very nice things. And I, I appreciate it. Well, you appreciate it. because They I mean, were all true, every word. And if I was, if it could have been longer than a minute, I would have kept talking. <laughs> well, the thing is, you're, you're an off, off Broadway person, too. It's like, and they're 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 slow and they're they're falling by the wayside. I mean, I first met you when you did John Chatterton's Midtown International Theater Festival, which launched a lot of off off Broadway talent. And then there was um, we lost Martin Denton, who was this wonderful reviewer who got an Innovative Theater Award because he was so so you know I can't think of the word. So you know what I mean. To he did, he did New York Theater .com, if I remember correctly, and and. Uh, it, it, he, it was a central location. When, when a show would run, they'd say, okay, is New York theater coming? He was a very powerful figure. So was John Chatterton. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, for, for so many different reasons, uh, they disappeared. 
Yeah. Genton so. put a book together of the reviews, right? I saw a big book at the Metropolitan Playhouse. They were selling it. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, I, I know you can access John Chatterton's reviews from Uber, the All Hall Broadway Review, uh -huh. uh, somewhere online. I always trip over them. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, uh, you, you can still get those reviews. So so I'm, I'm thrilled that, that, that All Hall Broadway history uh, continues in so many different ways. We're still yeah. trying to do it, of course. Uh, Jay and uh, I are both involved at the moment in the, the next year's version of my reviews. Uh, there's going to be a 2020 version of the book. And, uh, you know, about half of it are, are live things. And all of a sudden, one day, you know, the live world disappeared. So it's kind of historical. And after that, we do a slew of uh, online things like, you know, you've all been seeing. And that's another version of the book that's going to be coming out soon. So I hope it'll be a, his a historical use for somebody. I'm going to do a whole series on Jan's books on, on my, my uh, 2021 project, Channel I. Uh, listening to your other guests, it, it exemplified uh, uh, my mission for this coming year. Uh, theater can't die. And what we, what we don't realize is, is that in off-off-Broadway and even independent film, it always dies. It runs three performances at various festivals, and usually there's that Tuesday at two o'clock day, and, and hopefully your friends could come for, for those times. And then the play disappears. Mm. And, and that's really sad because uh, when, when you look at Off Off Broadway as a movement, it has changed the world. I just saw a documentary recently on, uh, on, on uh, Wynne Handman and the American Place Theater. And to see this magic that that has happened it's it's a shame that it disappears so so i want to try to find a way of creating a central location so uh plays can be recorded and put on there so people can see them days months years later independent films that would not get any chance other than like a tiny film festival somewhere could have a run there i we never get to meet people. It was so fascinating. You know, I, I don't get a chance because because my indie influencer recorded. I don't get a chance to listen to the interviews. And this was fascinating uh, when you when you were talking to the two young ladies. And and yes, Jen, I'm an old man too. Uh, they're young ladies. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, it was you so see the thing is this this uh, equity showcases. You know, they run for three weeks, then they disappear completely. Robert Patrick, great playwright, was a friend of mine when I started doing theater. He says, "Bina, don't do showcases because I did." many showcases and after three weeks your play just never comes back because no one wants it because that it was a must showcase. change and that i think that change. should be changed because by the time the show is ending that's when people are getting to know the show and then it ends you know so and then then that's it and i think this is a great idea you should audio you should record the plays and then the whole world can see it whenever they want to see it as someone who's been watching idea. this for a while now and who's been very very aware of how everything has exploded since the beginning of march when this started out with a tiny little thing from here and a tiny little thing from there and turned in a into a full-scale musical with 19 different people in 19 <laughs> different states you know uh really it has turned into something quite remarkable uh what's and it's not going away no it's not going away it's too accessible it's too easy and it's too necessary i i had a a friend uh, a dear friend who passed away from aids this is going back to the Me 80s too. i had that too and and i had i got an email from his sister uh, uh, like a decade later saying, do you have any videos of my brother when he performed with you? Because mm -hmm. our parents finally would like to see what he's done. And it broke my heart to say that it was a showcase and we couldn't record it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so I'm gonna even speak to equity and SAG and all of that. If there's some way, even if it becomes like a limited run, like, like six months later for only two weeks, but then it has to be at this time, Whatever it is, I don't think plays should be allowed to disappear. My experience with equity is that they do not allow you to to record the showcase to videotape no, unless and until every equity member in the show agrees. But you there's see. always one equity member who disagrees, so you can never do it. <laughs> but I'm curious. Well, we're a different we're world now. We're we're in pandemic. I don't think equity was around for any of the pandemics. They Except have just they have just won the right. They have just won the right to, to control the readings of plays, however. I was curious about something. I mean, speaking of equ equity, and I mean, you know, your friend, my friend also died of AIDS. But the thing is, he actually has a recording of the show that he did. It's a musical version of Reefer Madness. And oh. some other things that are, can they end up on your independent indie channel? 
I would like if if they are non-union or if uh, or if there's expirations on anything, definitely. Uh, if if there's any union stipulations, that's why I'm calling equity, and I would advise any producer that I will deal with to, for instance, if uh, uh, I'm working with Jan on his new play that's coming up. Uh, generally, in, speaking, in generally speaking, they're quite they're quite easy to deal with. Yes, that's now they, they are. They want, of course, they want their people to work, and that's the thing. You know, let's show the video on Channel I, and let's let audience see it. Uh, so how and can so now there's an archive. Submit their shows to you. How can people submit their shows to you? They they can email me at uh, jmcommnet at gmail.com. That's jmcommnet at gmail.com. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I've already, I put, I put up a Facebook notice about it. I've already gotten about 50 authors and producers who said, I have a videotape. I have a videotape going back 10 years. I have, okay, if I transferred this to a link and you did, uh, so many people want their work seen. Oh my gosh. And, and, and I'm not a history buff necessarily, but it's like, we forget history because it disappears. Uh, if I said Win Handman, now, now, Eva, you obviously uh, knew who I'm talking about, but if I was in a crowded room, how many people know that name? Lots of people, very young people, I'm sorry. I, I would love to be young again, but they're very naive in a way and they don't really want to learn. We were doing a touch of the Poe, Edgar Allan Poe's piece. Kevin was an uh, actor and I directed it and we're doing it in tiny little basement, you know, uh, actually Chatterton reviewed it and all that stuff. And somebody, a producer, a producer, I don't know, off Broadway, off of Broadway came and seriously said, is Edgar Allan Poe also coming? <laughs> I am not actually, making this up. This was a real story. Actually, it consider, a considering it's Edgar Allan Poe, it's you should have looked him right in the head. eye and went, he's already here. I, I'm happy to report that we get to review shows again. Yay! So, in the still in the Christmas spirit, even though it's January 2nd, I have a Stella Scrooge, A Christmas Carol with a Twist. Book by John Caird and Paul Gordon, music and lyrics by Paul Gordon, and directed by John Caird. John Caird and Paul Gordon's Stella Scrooge, A Christmas Carol with a Twist, employs many Dickens references and convoluted plot twists to raise the dead. A Stella Scrooge runs Bleak House, a labyrinth financial corporation run by seven generations of Scrooges. Her overworked assistant is a helpful Betty Cratchit, whose daughter, Tiny Tammy, is in need of medical benefits. Estella heads back to her old hometown of Pickwick, Ohio, to foreclose Hard House, a hostel for the disenfranchised, run by Pitt Nickleby, who shares a past with Estella. Will that be enough to melt her stony heart that was cultivated by her bitter aunt, Marla, who raised her? Will the quirky inhabitants of Hard House sway her, or finally resort to that old chestnut roasting of three spirits? John Caird and Paul Gordon have constructed a clever clever, funny, poignant musical using every Dickensian trick in the book. Utterly delightful and a technical marvel. Broadway may be closed, but not the caliber of performers or performances. It gets a happy face. Plus... Well, Irish Rep gave us a wonderful Christmas present that's actually appropriate for any time of year because Meet Me in St. Louis has the whole year leading up to the World's Fair 1904 in St. Louis. And I was familiar with the movie because I taught it for film classes and I love it. I'd never seen it as, you know, like a stage or now uh, online musical. And I was amazed I, at the technical tricks that they were able to do to get all these performers who were being filmed elsewhere and singing live to look like they were in the same space. What's the plot? Well, again, it's um, a family that is um, four daughters and one son living on Kensington Avenue in St. Louis, um, 1903 to 1904 when the fair will open. Um, and it centers really around Esther, who's the second daughter and who's falling desperately in love with the boy next door. And one of the loveliest songs is, how can I ignore the boy next door? <laughs> but then um, she meets him on the trolley, everything. 
Well, he was supposed to be there, but he came a little late. I felt the movie did handle that better because she kind of sang the excited part before he got on. And that sort of took away a little bit of her motivation for feeling the universe real when he actually does get on the trolley. But again, you know, like, um, I'm just kind of overly familiar with the film, teaching it in film studies. And I think the musical keeps up the spirit and the whole idea, like each season was introduced by a picture that looked like it was from a candy box or a really upscale candy yeah. box. So it's this interesting felt to note, the same spirit. Interesting to note, I think that um, uh, the the information that I gave in my review about uh, about uh, what to watch this this thing uh, to see how they did things. Uh, the guy that was getting onto the trolley had a pole with him, and that's all he had. He was he had a pole in front of a green screen. The rest of it was uh, was some, you know all projected. Yeah, no, it's like really things are getting to the point where it went from like. Um, <laughs> kind of zero degree of artistry and just presenting something yeah. to like really eye popping amazing new creations. It's really exploded. Never seen before. Yeah. Happy faces. Now I would like to review Audra McDonald because New York City is having itself a grand old gala with pure unadulterated Audra McDonald. And Michael Urey is a consummate, charming, and clever host in an audience of one at New York City Center. Ooh. Boy, am I jealous to have all that live wondrous singing all to himself. But wait, even better, I get to have her come directly into my living room and sing just to me. But wait, even more better, you get a chance to listen to this enchanted evening until January 3rd. There's a reason Miss McDonald won six Tony Awards. Her face and voice are so expressive <laughs> that she packs each song with pizzazz, which made this a very emotional concert. She is better than a cocktail. She bubbles over with talent and you can get your buzz on without a headache or empty calories. She is a gift to us, making us wrapped in rapture. So no excuses, attend this very special gala and open your heart and wallet and contribute to City Center to keep it going. So we have something to look forward to when we return to the theater. Happy face. Feinstein's 54 Below is back with Sondheim Unplugged. The one good thing about COVID is that when I finally have time to see the shows I have always wanted to go to, I finally can, and Sondheim Unplugged is one of them. There is nothing better than being alive in the company of a Sondheim evening of songs with the talented Telly Long, Lucia Spina, Nicholas Rodriguez, Darius DeHaas, Natalie Douglas, and T. Oliver Reed. So not only do you get performers at the top of their profession, but also the erudite Philip Je Phil Jeffrey Bond, who created this, telling us juicy little tidbits and anecdotes about the shows the songs are from with accompanying stills of the various shows. I agree with Laura McCarts in the chat who said, I count myself lucky to have lived in the time of Sondheim. Count yourself even luckier if you catch this show of Sondheim Unplugged, which is available until January 9th. Happy face. Um, just a quick note, because I didn't know this was going to be able to be streamed on demand later on, but I saw this really good play by Parody Productions called Stop Action, and it's about this, a fam this mother who's in a stroke and she hasn't talked in 10 years, and the brother and sister come and they think that the sister that's been looking after their mother is a screw up. And it's how every, the family, the dynamics and how they all resolve. It, it's really well written and well done. And I, I just really liked it and I recommend it. Happy face. Two shows I'd like to mention. One is new as yesterday, one from the distant past. The Here Art Center has done it again with a brilliant Zoom cast of Kamala Sankaram's new serial space opera, Only You Will Recognize the Signal. Created in collaboration with librettist Rob Handel and here's founding artistic director Kristen Marting, this remarkable piece is set aboard the Grand Crew, a luxurious spaceship transporting a group of settlers to a new planet. The passengers are supposed to sleep in therapeutic hypothermia until their arrival, but there's a computer glitch they're waking up too soon, 
and unable to exit their pods are slowly going insane, requiring more help than the ship's charming but inept computer, Bob, is programmed to give them. Set in seven 10 minute sequences, originally broadcast live on separate dates, the entire opera is now available on demand until February 15th. As I said previously, Ms. Sakaram is a composer of genius. Her music is stunning, her technical expertise remarkable, no doubt inspired to a great degree by Mr. Handel and the digitally savvy Miss Martin, with whom she has worked in the past. This is an opera in the grandest sense of the word. A mature art speaking with a modern voice of science fiction marvels that are changing our world. Absolutely first rate in every sense, Kamala Sakaram and her team should be composing for the Metropolitan Opera. Happy Face Plus. Now we leap from the 21st to the 19th century for Cox and Box, a short operetta written by Bernand and Sullivan in 1866. Bernand, you say? What happened to Gilbert? Well, Sullivan composed this piece for a private club before he and Gilbert ever met. Based on a farce by John Madison Morton, it was the first successful comic opera Sullivan ever wrote. The story concerns a landlord who rents a room to two complete strangers, one who works at night and one who works during the day. When one of them has the day off, they meet each other in the room and tempers flare. The New York Gilbert and Sullivan players have done a splendid job bringing this excellent piece to life. Originally conceived for three actors and piano, it actually contains up-to-date themes of unintentional social distancing, while allowing audiences to enjoy a fully staged work. This is the third iteration of this production from creative producer David Macaluso and music director Elizabeth Hastings, with the film being brought to life by director Matthew Wages with a vision more in line with situational comedy and 21st century sensibilities. Beautifully sung and presented with a remarkable understanding of the vaudeville style, this thoroughly delightful piece runs through January 2nd. Happy face all around. And now, with my wonderful Tom Broadway 2003 champagne glass, I, I toast this new year, and let's open up our caviar and celebrate, because theater and happiness and good times and a new president, there's lots to talk about. I toast all of you. Happy New Year. That's wonderful. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you. I like this.